wonderful singing tonight. Take your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11 this evening. Hebrews chapter number 11. This weekend is the Cubbles Retreat. Let's so make sure you're in prayer for that. The Gomez, he preaches to us and strengthens our marriages this weekend. Looking forward to that. And then one announcement for you. We need help in the print shop tomorrow and Friday beginning at 9 o'clock, collating scripture. So if you can help that, see Brother Al or Sister Heidi at uh, some point tonight and let them know so they can prepare for that. Hebrews chapter number 11 is where we're going to be tonight. We'll read the first three verses. Before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for our time now to gather around your word. Thank you for the sweet songs that we've sung uh, to worship you, Lord, how they've lifted our hearts. We pray now that as we study your word, that you'd help us, you'd feed us, give us something uh, to strengthen us from your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read just the first three verses to begin. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that, the thing, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. This is our third and final installment of our uh, intermittent and uh, mini-series on the irony in which God, uh, irony in the ways in which God deals with man. What we've discovered over the past few weeks is that God has designed the spiritual world to operate according to a principle of irony. The natural mind cannot comprehend the spiritual because of this very fact. To the natural mind, what is actually right appears to be wrong. And what is actually wrong appears to be right. And as God has designed it this way, it is not a mistake that God has designed it this way, uh, but it is, uh, nor is it due to the fact that God's ways are simply higher than our ways. But in fact, God specifically designed the spiritual world to operate in such, a, such an ironic way in order that He might receive glory and that we might trust in Him. We began several weeks ago by considering, first of all, the irony that is seen in the judgment of God upon sin. Then a couple weeks ago, we considered the irony that is seen in salvation. What a glorious truth it is that the death of Christ is the ultimate death, the beginning of the death of the one who has the power over death. And the death of Christ is turned into the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. And the death of Christ is also turned into the basis of our spiritual life. What a wonderful truth it is. And, and frankly, I'm disappointed in myself uh, for doing such a poor job at expounding such a glorious truth. And even though I, I did such a poor job, it's a, it's a great truth that is worthy of our meditation and consideration. The lamb was slain, and by being slain, slew his enemies. What a glorious, glorious truth that is. Uh, tonight we will conclude uh, this thought by considering the irony that is in the Christian life. The irony of the Christian life. And I want us to focus primarily tonight on the irony of our faith, as we see from the passage we've chosen for this evening. But before we get there, there's really a lot of different ways that we could take uh, this message concerning the irony that is found in the Christian life. There are really so many different ways in which we find irony in our Christian journey. So what I want to do to begin with is, is just briefly survey some of the other areas where we find some irony, and my hope is, is that maybe you jot a thought or two down and perhaps study it out on, perhaps study it out on your own. I mean, first of all, consider that from its very inception, a Christian is one who knowingly or not embraces irony. Consider the fact that Jesus Christ is our King. We claim Him as our King. We rejoice in the fact that He is our King. We chose Him as our king. Amen. But consider the crown that our king wore. Right. The only crown that our king knew on this earth was a crown that was comprised of thorns. Right. Right. Consider the robe of royalty that was placed upon our king. It was forced upon him. Right. And it was done a a out of a, a desire to mock his claims as king. Yes, you look at the subjects of our king. They were the ones that rejected him and were ultimately responsible for him being crucified and killed. Now, Jesus was apparently, from all human points of view, was apparently a failure. 
Now, we would not think of any other human beings in the same, same terms, in the same context that we think of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no other club, there's no group, there's no person that we would follow like Jesus Christ. And yet, when you think about how dispossessed and rejected and forsaken that Christ was, it's very ironic that we esteem Him to be such a great person, such someone who is wor worthy of our worship and our emulation. Here we are tonight, hopefully, uh, putting unwavering loyalty and undying love in Jesus Christ. There's no one else like Him. And yet He was a rejected King. And yet He is our accepted King. To make matters more perplexing, the instrument of death of our Lord Jesus Christ was that of a cross. And we might say that the cross is the symbol of our faith. It is the symbol which most Christians, or really all Christians worldwide, love and adore. We love the cross. We sing songs about the cross. We love uh, and adore the cross, and we love and adore Christ who hung on the cross. But it's so ironic that we rejoice in the instrument of death of our King. That's a very ironic thing to do. But we understand that the cross of Christ is the basis of our life. And so we rejoice in the very death of our king. What a very ironic thing to do. And yet, we can see irony in other areas of the Christian life as well. Another area of irony that we find is found in Mark chapter 10, where Jesus is teaching his disciples uh, the necessity of self-abasement, the necessity of sacrifice, of humility, of service in following Jesus Christ. You remember what he said there in Mark chapter 10? He said, the, the first shall be last, and the last first. First last, and the last will be first. And Jesus said that, I, I think, out of anticipation of uh, what was about to come. There was a rising contention among the ranks of the disciples. about uh, they, they were jockeying for positions of power in the coming kingdom of Christ. And that contention rose to a peak when James and John came to Jesus just a few verses after Jesus said, the first should be last and the last first. And they asked him for seats of power in the coming kingdom of Christ. And Jesus basically repeated to those two disciples exactly what he had just said uh, prior when he said, Whosoever will be greatest among you shall be your minister, that is, shall be your servant. And whosoever you, uh, of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. But you know, that's directly backwards to how it works in the quote-unquote real world. We live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, don't we? Where the only way that you can get justice in, the, in this world and get what you deserve is if you look out for yourself. If you start looking out for others and start allowing yourself to be taken advantage of, you will be taken advantage of. And that is one thing you can, you can take to the bank for sure. But Christ's kingdom operates in a very ironic principle. You don't get to greatness in Christ's kingdom by looking out for your own. You get to greatness in Christ's kingdom by forsaking your own, by humbling yourself, by serving others, by following the example that Christ gave to us when he was on the earth. It's very backward to our instincts. It's not what we would expect, but it's the ironic way in which God rewards humble service in his kingdom. Another irony that we can observe in the Christian life is our relationship to wisdom. Paul said in 2 or 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 he said, "Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in the world, let him become a fool that he may be wise." If you want to be wise in God's eyes, then you must be willing to accept being looked at as a foolish person in the world's eyes. On the other hand, you want to be wise in the world's eyes, then you must accept that you will be looked as a fool, looked at as a fool by God Himself. And God has designed it such that in order to uh, attain the wisdom of God, or godly wisdom rather, you must approach Him with a childlike, a very simple childlike faith. That's the only way to attain godly wisdom in this world. And it's why it's a rather ironic thing that as you work your way up the academic circles in this world, it seems to be the smarter you get in this world, the harder it is to accept the veracity of God's Word. The harder it is to accept that God actually created the world in six literal days. The harder it is 
to actually accept Adam as the historical first person. Uh, it, it is a simple childlike faith in what, the God, in what God said in His Word. That is, that is godly wisdom. And yet the smarter you get, the harder it is to accept godly wisdom. It's a very ironic thing. And yet, when we, it, it's interesting to note that, that as you work your way up the academic circles, the more um, intense the mockery gets of those who believe in these things, believing that God created the world in six literal days, believing in a historical Adam, believing in a real flood, a global flood during Noah's days, you're mocked relentlessly in the academic world for believing such foolish, foolish things. And yet, when we think about what they actually think about the origins of the world and our ancestry, boy, we are not the fools. It is they who are actually, actually the fools. Uh, in order to be wise before God, you must accept that you will be foolish in the world's eyes. And in order to be, fool, to be wise in the world's eyes, you must accept that you will be, fool, uh, you will be foolish in God's eyes. Uh, consider another irony found in the Christian life. And it's that God's strength is made perfect in human weakness. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he even says something that, that, that apparently contradicts itself. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, When I am weak, then I am strong. That makes no sense uh, to the human mind. Then I, when I am weak, then I am strong. And yet... I think we would all attest to the truth of what Paul is saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, when I trust in myself, when I am strong, I have a tendency to trust in myself. Right. And when I am weak, I have more of a tendency to put my trust in yes, God, sir. or at least I am drawn more yes, to put my trust in, trust in God. Right. And no matter how frail I am as a human, if I am trusting in God, I am strong. And no matter how strong I am as a human, right. when I am trusting in myself, I am weak. And when you compare these two situations, trusting in myself when I'm strong and trusting in God when I am weak, they do not compare. When I am weak, I am strong. And when I am strong, that is when I am weak. You see the irony of the Christian life. One more irony that I would point out to you before we move to our primary topic for this evening. And the irony is found embedded in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which is a very familiar verse to us all. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. It's a wonderful promise that we can all cling to, and we can cling to even in troubling times, even the worst of times. And when we do not understand what God is doing, we do know that when God is done doing what He is doing, that it will be good. It will, be, it will bring glory to Him, and it will be good for us. But the irony here is found in, the, in, 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 in that God is able to turn what man means for evil into good. Right. That's the ironic way in which God works. You think about Joseph, the biblical example of Joseph, who's the premier example of, uh, of God's ironic way of turning what man means for evil into good uh, for, for God's chosen people. And, and, and when you look at the beginning of Joseph's life, he was... Uh, he was dealt an unimaginably evil hand. His brothers did truly an unimaginably evil thing by selling him into slavery. They meant it for evil. They meant him for evil. And yet God worked it out for good. Through the twists and the turns of Joseph's life, when you get to near the end of his life, later on in his life, you see him standing before his brothers who sold him into slavery in a position, this time he's in a position of power, not in a position of weakness. And he looks them in the eyes and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And truly that is the case. That God took what those boys meant for evil and he worked it to the saving of God's chosen people and indeed many, many more people than just the Israelites. Now having briefly considered these various ironies, I want us to move on to the primary focus tonight, which is faith. Faith. We see this from Hebrews chapter 11, which is the primary, the premier chapter on uh, Christian faith. And what we find here in Hebrews chapter 11 is that our faith in unseen realities is really what ties all of these things together. Our faith is. And the author begins the chapter 
uh, uh, he is going to survey a, uh, a history of certain faithful, uh, faith-filled individuals. But he begins the chapter by defining what faith is. He says in verse number 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Boy, that's a profound, profound verse worthy of much meditation. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And what, what I believe the author is saying is that if we have faith, it will produce in us a life that is consistent with what it hopes for. And when we have faith, our life will be the evidence that we believe in something that is more significant than what we can see with our physical eyes. Now what we can attest to is that there is an inward struggle, a struggle between two essentially two different worldviews, contrasting worldviews even. Uh, on the one hand, you have a worldly, earthly perspective. Uh, or earthly perspective. It sees only that which can be seen with the eyes. It feels the, it feels the physical. It, it deals in human instincts. It prioritizes the here and the now because it instinctively knows that the future for the world is not bright. It's not a good one. On the other hand, there is a, wor a, a heavenly perspective, a heavenly worldview. It looks beyond what can be seen with the eyes, and it sees what cannot be seen with the, the, the physical eyes. It, it sees a, 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 a future. It sees, I don't want to say it sees God, but it, but it sees God working. It sees the truth of God. It sees the reality of God's world, word. Now, these worldviews are not compatible with each other. Uh, they, they contradict each other. They contrast against, uh, against each other. And either you will live with the one worldview, the earthly worldview, or you will live with the other, the heavenly worldview. And what we find in chapter 11 is that when you live according to the earthly worldview, you prioritize things like pleasure, comfort, the things of this world, the things that are temporary. But when you live according to a heavenly perspective, you live for eternal things, things that are not temporal or bound to this earth. And as the author surveys people that lived according to a heavenly perspective, we find the one common attribute that binds them together. And it's faith. Faith. Faith is the mechanism by which we take on for ourselves that heavenly perspective of reality. And what we find is that through faith, we embrace the irony of the Christian, the Christian life. The irony is this, that when we forsake the things of, that are bound to this world, when we forsake the temporal pleasure, the temporal comfort of this world, it is directly by forsaking those temporal pleasures and comforts that we attain for ourselves the eternal pleasures and comforts that we seek for ourselves. It's very ironic, but that's exactly how we can expect God to work. I think we would all agree that it is very difficult to, for us to embrace the heavenly perspective of this world. It's very difficult for us to truly live by faith, to not live for the temporal things of this world. We know we should. Don't get me wrong. We know we should. But it betrays what we see. It betrays what we hear. It betrays what we feel. It betrays what we instinctively know and instinctively want. But as we look through this chapter, as we see the examples of men and women who embrace the heavenly perspective, we find the faith that allowed them to embrace that heavenly perspective. And I want us to just, for the, with the rest of our time, look at a few of these examples. We're obviously not going to go through the entire chapter, but just looking at a few of these examples to see the faith of those that embrace the heavenly perspective. We see in the first example found in verse number 4, the, the, faith of, the faith of Abel. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, read the verse again to yourself and, and set aside what you know about the story of Cain and Abel from the book of Genesis and other places in Scripture. Just set aside those and just read verse number 4. If all you knew about Cain and Abel was from Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4, you would think very differently about the story of Cain and Abel. 
Uh, there's no evidence from verse number 4 that Cain murdered Abel. In fact, the only thing that we really see is God's perspective of the story of Cain and Abel. We see that Abel was way better off than Cain was. Uh, Abel was the one approved, accepted by God, and Cain was the one that was rejected by God. Uh, and what we see here, the lesson for us from this first example, is that, that God's perspective is very, very different from a human perspective. When we look back at the human perspective of things found in, in the early part of Genesis, we would think very differently than the takeaway from chapter four, or ch ch Hebrews chapter 11. But when we take on faith's perspective, that heavenly perspective, don't we realize that Abel was way better off than Cain was? I mean, yeah, Cain went on to live, but he would have... Uh, but he was far worse off than Abel was. I mean, Abel was the one that was accepted by God. Cain was the one that was rejected by God. And even now, Cain is the one that is in everlasting punishment for his sin, and Abel is the one that is resting peacefully in the arms of God. Who do you think is better off, Cain or Abel? Uh, when you take on the heavenly perspective, uh, the circumstances of this world begin to fade away. And you begin to see things from God's perspective. We look at verse number 7, a second example, this, uh, this being that of Noah. Verse number 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and become heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And what we see emphasized here, verse number 7, is the apparent contradiction between what is seen with the eyes and what is not seen with the eyes. See, in verse number 7, there had never been a flood, not even a local one. So Noah had no point of reference by which to understand a flood. There was no sign of a flood on the horizon. There was no physical evidence to see a flood coming around the corner. And yet, Noah built an ark. He prepared for something that he had never seen before with his own eyes. And though it took him decades, literally decades, to build that ark, he just kept on building and kept on building and kept on trusting God. Noah chose to believe God's word against what the world told him, the mockery of the world, and what his eyes could not see. And in the end, we see in verse number 7, the reward of his faith was that he and his family were saved while the whole world was destroyed by the judgment of God. You know, Peter noted some similarities between the times of Noah and the times in which we live ourselves. Uh, the, 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 the point that Peter makes in 2 Peter, is, in 2 Peter chapter 3 is that there are going to be scoffers and mockers in the last days that are going to come and say, where's the promise of His coming? Where's the evidence of His coming? You say He's coming again, but where's the promise of His coming? Where's the evidence of His coming? And you know, sometimes we as believers are tempted to to think something similar to that. Now, we don't think about it from a scoffer's standpoint. We wouldn't dare do that. But when we look at the affairs of the world today, we think things are so bad that surely the Lord is about to come. Surely the affairs are so bad in this world that the Lord's return is right around the corner. Now, the reality is, is that's terrible doctrine. The affairs of the world have nothing to do with the imminency of the return of Christ had nothing to do with whether Christ could come tonight or could come in a thousand years. In fact, you do realize that Christ could come back in a thousand years. He very well could. And in fact, things could get a whole lot worse than they are in the next thousand years before Christ returns. And yet, He's still coming again. He's still coming again. In fact, that's what Peter said. When Peter says in 2 Peter 3, uh, that a day as with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is, is as a day with the Lord. That's exactly what he's saying. Is, is you can't predict his coming. You, you can't pinpoint the timing of God. God operates on a very different time frame than, than humanity does. And the Lord doesn't need to prove the evidence of his return. He proved it when he said he was going to return again. That's all we need. And that's all he needs to give. And again, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, says that when the Lord returns, He's going to return, uh, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's not going to come expectantly. 
It's not going to come when you see evidence of his return. It's not going to come when you expect him to come, but he is going to return. He's going to return unexpectedly. And what we should do is do exactly what Noah did. Just keep building and keep trusting in the Lord. Keep building and keep battling and keep trusting in the Lord. We may not see the evidence of his return. We may not see things getting better around the corner but we know that He is going to return. We can trust that. And we do and we should trust that. We look at the next example found in verses 8 and 11, uh, uh, that of Abraham. Abraham is used a couple of times in this chapter. And we find something unique uh, about Abraham here revealed to us. First of all, we see the, really the same thing that we see in Noah and Abel. And that is that Abraham directed his life according to what he could not see with his eyes. We see in verse number 8, let's read the verses. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, through faith also Sarah herself received strength, conceived seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. We find Abraham looking for a city that was built by God. That's not a physical city. We find him promised a land uh, but was not able to lay his eyes on the land, at least not when he began that journey. We find the later years of his life that Abraham was promised a son, though all physical appearances suggested that that was a human impossibility. We see in verses 17 to verses 19 that Abraham was commanded to offer his son as a burnt sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, Abraham was a man of remarkable faith, and yet what makes the story of Abraham unique from Noah, and especially that of Abel, is that the difficulty that arose in Abraham's life, at least in these examples, was directly the doing of God. It was God's doing. God introduced the difficulty into Abraham's life that provoked his faith. In fact, back in Genesis chapter 22, it's very interesting to see how the author of Genesis refers to the tempting of God of Abraham. He refers to it as just that. It's a word that I would almost be uncomfortable with that God tempted Abraham, and yet it seems to be that's exactly what he did. He tempted Abraham. See, God could have told Abraham exactly where he was going and exactly the land and the parameters of the land that he was promised, but he didn't. God could have given Abraham a child when he was 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, etc. He didn't. He gave him a child when he was 100 years old. Uh, he could have not asked Abraham to offer his son, but he did. He made things more difficult for Abraham. And you think about it this way. Along the journey of Abraham's faith, there were times when God seemed to contradict his own word. What an interesting thing, that God seemed to contradict his own promises to Abraham. Again, that's why he refers, I think that's why Genesis 22 refers to it as the tempting of Abraham by God. And what I think this teaches us is that there are, there are pushes uh, all around us to get us to live by that earthly perspective. There is a push from the world. There is a push from within us. And sometimes there seems to be a push from even God himself right. when he seems to contradict his own world. Now, uh, God's not pushing us to take on, to embrace an earthly perspective of things. Not at all. Uh, let's, not, uh, let's not attribute evil to the Lord. But He's putting us in a decision point. Are we going to trust what the Lord said, or are we going to trust in our own sight, in what we see, what we can perceive, and how we can work things out for ourselves? And then we see in verses 24 and verse 29, to verses 29, we see the example of Moses. Verse 24, by faith, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Moses is perhaps the most stark contrast between living for that earthly perspective, living for ourselves and living for God, living with, uh, with the perspective of what cannot be seen with physical eyes. I mean, can you imagine putting yourself in Moses' shoes and choosing to suffer rather than choosing to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt? Moses could have very easily stayed in the way of wealth, the way of power, the way of ease. I mean, he was in the family of royalty. It would have been a very easy path for him to continue in. And you imagine how easy of a life Moses must have had in Egypt. And yet Moses made the active decision, the active choice to forsake all of that and identify with the oppressed people of God. From an earthly perspective, it was a very foolish decision. I mean, you look at how the, the, the author of Hebrews contrasts the choice of Moses. He says he, fors, he, he, he forsook the enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. He embraced suffering affliction with the people of God. He forsook the treasures in Egypt. He embraced the reproach of Christ. And in verses 26 to 27, we, we really see the, the key to Moses' faith. Uh, in the very end of verse 26, he said, For he had respect unto the recompense of of the reward through faith, uh, verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who, in, who is invisible, that is, seeing uh, God himself. See, Moses knew, he knew that God, God was going to right the wrongs of this world. There was going to come a day when God was going to judge Egypt for their sin, and there was going to come a day that God was going to reward the faithful for their suffering and for their service to him. And Moses chose to not fear the king of Egypt, but to fear the king of glory rather. And what the Holy Spirit is emphasizing to us through the example of Moses is that he realized that his decision to forsake Egypt and to embrace Israel and to embrace the oppressed people of God had an effect upon his, upon his possessions in the life hereafter. The decisions that Moses made in Egypt to forsake Egypt had an impact on his eternity. That in choosing to refuse the treasures and the pleasures of Egypt, Moses was promised to receive pleasures and treasures in heaven. And that is the irony that we must live in. That's the irony of our faith, is that we refuse to live for the here and now. And it's so, refuse, and it's so refusing to live for the pleasures and treasures of this world, we receive for ourselves pleasures and treasures in the life hereafter. See, what is true of saints or what is true of sinners is also true of saints as well. We talked about it a few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago. Things are not always as they appear. They seem to be enjoying their life now, and yet we know that one of these days God will turn their pleasure into misery. And the plight of the Christian may be rejection and identification with the reproach of Christ, but when we identify with the reproach of Christ, we know that God will one day turn that reproach into glory. Now, as the author concludes Hebrews chapter 11, he points us to several more examples, and I just want to point out one thing about these final examples, this final portion of Hebrews chapter 11. We'll read verses 32 to verse 38, and I want you to notice something different between verses 32 to verse 35, the first phrase in verse 35, and then notice the difference between that and the end of the beginning, the, the middle to the end of verse 38, the middle of verse 35 to the end of 38. Verse 32, what shall I, say, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, of Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies 
uh, the, the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. And then notice the change. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mocking and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and, and in dens and caves of the earth. Well, do you see the difference between these two groups? The first group conquered through faith. They were victorious through their faith in God. The last group did not seem to conquer. They seemed to, to be an utter and abject failure. They were tortured. They were oppressed. They were forsaken. They were destitute. They were afflicted. Uh, they, were, they were crucified. They were killed. They were sawn asunder. They were tortured and killed, mocked and scourged, wrongfully imprisoned. And yet both of these groups lived by faith. Both of these groups were accepted by God. And I think the point is, is that we cannot be assured of our, uh, of our earthly outcomes. The justice of God is not always served in the here and now. Sometimes we see the irony of God's justice poured, poured out upon the wicked. Sometimes we see righteous people living uh, great lives, having great success, doing a great work for God, and it seems like God is blessing. Other times we see the righteous that are forsaken, uh, or, or that not forsaken by God, but seem to be forsaken, seemed to be oppressed, seemed to be afflicted and destitute. And the reality is, is that we don't live by faith. We, live by, or we don't live by sight. We live by faith. We don't look at the outcome in this world, but we live and hope for the outcome of the next world. Our lives is to be evidence of a faith in God and a faith in a better world that awaits us beyond this world. That's exactly how we are to live. This is by faith. Not looking at what our eyes can see, but looking beyond what we can see in this world. Because in the end, we are confident that, that we serve a God who works all things together for good, even the worst of things. Even those things that have the worst of intentions behind them, God is able and does turn those things around for His own glory and for our own good.